Hey guys, what's up? My name is Gabe and this is Games with Gabe and this is the next episode in the Game Engine Concepts series. So in this episode, what we're going to be talking about is serialization and deserialization, which is a huge topic. And so we're only going to cover the broad principles and some good practices that you should try and follow if you can. Now, what is serialization? Well, we all know that when you have some game, you eventually want to ship it and when you ship it, you will usually have a bunch of levels or worlds or maps, whatever you want to call it. You just have a bunch of these, right? And this is one part of serialization. The way you could get this to ship with your game is one of two ways. You could either hard code this. So you could hard code this directly into your code, every single level. That's how they did it in like the 80s and the 90s with the original Super Mario Bros because they were writing an assembly and had a very limited space or you could load files. And so loading from files would be like you ship some binary data along with your game and all that binary data contains files that have all these maps and stuff already preloaded in memory at the default states so that when the player starts, they can start playing from that map. Now, this is easy to picture, like you need this, but how in the world do you turn all of these different things into some form of text data that you can load and unload on start and end of your scene without taking up gigabytes of data too. Like storing this efficiently is one thing and then storing it so that you can actually reload it is another thing too. Because think about it. These are a whole bunch of different textures that are located in different parts of your world. You have to have some sort of way to identify which texture uh, goes at which position and which map it's a part of. You have to have some way to identify how the player character is put together, where to put his arms, what item he's holding, all of this different stuff, and somehow serialize all this, which can seem like a really daunting task if you have no idea where to start. So there's typically two phases of the serialization. You have your development phase, which is sort of what we're talking about right now, and then you have your production phase. Development phase focuses on serializing your world and scene data so that you can ship that to your player. Your player will never be saving this because it'll already be saved. He'll only be loading it. Whereas we'll be the one saving it and tweaking it and making changes to it. Your production phase is more like game save slot. These are where you're saving logic about your, the state of your game. So you'd be saving, you know, what the current level the player's on, their XP, what they may have in their inventory, all that stuff. And so that's completely different than the actual world scene. Unless you're in a game like Minecraft, because then the world is essentially a save slot and then you have some extra metadata which gives you the current level xp and everything like that and so typically your engine will have one phase of serialization for all this which you can borrow to use for your game logic serialization but you won't necessarily be using the same exact methods because you don't want to serialize everything when you're doing save slots you really just want to serialize a few key pieces of information so that uh, you can load the game at an appropriate phase. Okay, and so the way that I typically break down my development phase is I will break it down into entities. That's the main composition of the world, and that is what we will break it into. And so if I can break it down into entities, this is a much easier thing to grasp than looking at this scene and saying, how in the world do I serialize all this stuff? Well, if we say, okay, we'll break it down into the entities, which is the logical breakdown. So this would be one entity this is another entity, this is another one, or maybe this is all one big entity, you never know. But yeah, and so you break this down into a bunch of entities, then each entity has several components, hopefully, if you're following a pretty good architecture, and maybe you don't even have a concept of an entity, actually, you just have components, which is valid too. Well then, the problem has basically solved itself. Now, all we have to think about is how do we serialize these components? And so that is basically the essence of serialization of a world or scene. You just have to figure out how to serialize components. And components are things like sprite renders, physics components, so like box colliders, transforms, transformations, so like where is the player in the world, their XYZ coordinates. All that stuff is examples of components. Think of Unity and their components. That's the type of stuff that you want to serialize. For the production phase you'll be able to use the same techniques we use here, except it will break down into save slots, right? You have your player's different save slots, and then for each save slot, you as the game designer will want to come up with a good 
features to mark their save status. You know, do you want enemies to respawn if they go back to a certain portion of the map? Or if they kill those enemies, do you want those enemies to stay dead? And so these are the types of things you would think about when you're creating the save data for your save slots. And then it would basically just break up into the different features of the game and the different pieces of logic that you want to save out. Okay, so this is all good, but <laughs> let's break this down a little bit more so that we can see a more concrete example of how exactly we can do this. So what I like to do is I like to use JSON, which if you have a good JSON library, then it will also be able to convert it to something called BSON, which is just binary JSON, so it compresses it even more, and that just saves some space and makes it faster. Typically, you save the BSON for production when you're shipping. You don't usually use this when you're debugging and testing and stuff because you want it to be in a readable format when you're trying to figure things out. And so if you are developing in Java, C++, or C Sharp, these are some good libraries I know of. Java, I would say use Google's JSON. It's similar to JSON, except it's amazing and it makes it feel like things just work. You have to do very little to get every single type of object you could imagine to serialize using JSON. Then for C++, I use a library called nloman JSON, and I'll have links to these in the description too, so you can check them out if you want to. This is just a standard JSON library, and it converts it to XML output, BSON output, JSON output. You can use anything, and it has the same interface. And then you have C Sharp. You can just use the built-in system.txt.json, which is also very nice and very easy to use the way Microsoft has put it. If you're using uh, POCOs is what they call it, plain old CLR objects, which just basically means it's made up of primitives and you don't have anything too complex in there. So like you couldn't have a complex object because that might throw this off. So you can tweak it too, from what I've seen. I haven't actually used this one. So this is the only one I don't have experience with, but the other two I have used and they are both great. Okay, so once you decide on a JSON library, and I would highly recommend you use a library and not your right, your own. I've done both and the library typically <laughs> works better, has less bugs, and you can just trust it. Whereas when you write your own, you just create more of a headache for yourself. So you need to come up with a format for your data. Now, uh, I would say the single most important thing in your format is a version number. This becomes increasingly important if you actually start to release and ship builds. This version number is your key to how to deserialize every single one of your components, okay? And every single component should have a version, and every single version should be unique to that component depending on whatever version they are on. Then, basically what you do is for every single component, you would add a serialize method. That serialize method would turn it into something like this. So, say you have a class sprite render. Inside that class, you would have a serialize method, which would output a string or JSON object that just looks like this. Right? It would take every single property inside of that object and then it would convert it to another JSON object. And so if you had something like another object, say this was like a vector three, then you would then convert this to its appropriate object and store it in there. And so it's sort of like it goes down in phases, right? First, we're saying, okay, serialize this. And then if we come to another object, we call serialize on that object. So in this case, uh, vector three would also have a serialize and then we would call that and that would store it like this and then so on and so forth. For assets, do not store the asset data. Do not store a picture or something inside of the component. Store an ID, okay? And then this ID will ideally map to some actual file on your computer, and that file contains the data. Use IDs all the time when you can because it saves so much space. This will take what could turn a save file from gigabytes into like kilobytes. And then you will, of course, want to store your entity ID. And these entity IDs it could be whatever you want it to be. But basically, it's just some unique ID for every single entity in your game world. And this way, you can associate what this component should be added to, who, which entity it should be given back to. And then, of course, the version number. How do you use this version number, though? So if you have version numbers, these are helpful for deserialization. When it comes to serializing, the version number isn't that important. It's when you're deserializing that it is very important because that's going backwards. So that's going from this to this. And the way I typically do that is, of course, you'll be looping through uh, whatever JSON object you get back from your file. And then you'll basically say, OK, if I run into something that says sprite render, uh, call sprite renders deserialize method. And then 
this will return a sprite render object based on this data. Then what you will specifically want to do is you want to have deserialize, which takes in an integer, and that integer is the version. Now this version will then dispatch to a specific deserialize method, so it would be like deserialize three, which basically just means deserialize version three, and that would deserialize according to whatever the specific version is. Now, every time you update the actual format of your data, you just pass in whatever version's here, and then it will call the appropriate function, and that way you won't have any breaking changes when you update your game engine, your game, whatever, to your users. They won't experience any problems because you can just update these functions and it will always get called appropriately based on whatever you're using. Version numbers are very important. Don't forget that. Now, let's take a look at a couple concrete code examples I can show you. All right, so the first example we're taking a look at here is the component deserializer that I have inside of my game engine series that we're going through. And this uses JSON and is written in Java. This is literally all that you need for deserialization and serialization using JSON. This is what I mean about how this is pretty magical because based on this, it will correctly turn it back into the object that you need and convert the object to a string. Uh, the way it works is it basically, when you serialize, you serialize the type, which is just the class name of whatever thing you're trying to do. And then you say, okay, and then serialize the properties, which are just all of the variables. And you use this other method, which just goes in and basically loops through and calls this again using JSON. Then when you deserialize, you get the type as a string, and then you get the properties. And then you just say, try and deserialize the element for the class name from that string. And then it figures everything out for you. The one downside to this is You'll notice you can't use versioning with this. You could use versioning, but you would have to go into it and do a little bit more work to get that to work properly. And then you would sort of lose the whole benefit of this anyways. So JSON is amazing. You can find more details about this. I'll have a link to the videos where I actually go and create these so you can find out more about this if you would like. Let's look at C++ though. All right, so this is my C++ version of the game engine that I'm currently working on. And this is just the render systems serialization and deserialization methods. So basically what happens is it goes through and it calls serialize whenever I call save on my game or whatever on every single component. And inside the serialize method, I basically have these uh, I, I build the JSON object and then I just add it to the array that gets passed in. So basically we have the main JSON object, which is the entire game world scene. And then I put this specific component that was passed in through here into this JSON object. And you'll notice for things like color, which is another, this is actually a vector three, um, vector three or vector four. I go ahead and I call another serialized method on that. And then I just add that to this. So sort of that inception I was talking about. And then you'll notice I get the asset ID if it has an asset. And then I get the Z index and I just get everything, every property that I want. And then I get the size of um, this current JSON object so that I can place this component into there. And I basically just place this JSON object in here as a sprite renter. And I get the entity's ID and add that. You'll also notice I'm not using versioning here. <laughs> this is not a good idea on my part. I should be using versioning, but since it's still not even at an alpha phase, I'm fine without using versioning right now. Then when I go to deserialize, I get some JSON object in and I get some entity, which is the entity that this JSON object was attached to, which we know from this ID. And then I basically create a new sprite render object. Then I just say deserialize for the complex objects. And then I figure out that was the sprite render color. And I know that because we serialized it as color here. And then I just say, if there's an asset ID, then get the asset ID. And then I get the Z index. And then I just add the component to the entity. So serialization is in deserialization are actually fairly simple still, even in C++. And you just have to make sure that you copy this method for every single one. And ideally, you would have deserialization for every single version, which I will probably be adding soon. This does seem tedious, and it is. But if you're using a scripting language in C++ or something, I would say that your best bet is to do this in manually for all the components that you want to be fast. 
And then for user-defined compo components in the scripting language, I would suggest using a method more like the Java version and combining the two. That way, you only have to do this for a limited number of components. Then when the user defines the other components, they will be serialized and deserialized automatically. All right, that about covers it for this tutorial, though. If you wanted to do this for your game logic, you would just follow this same pattern, and you could even use the same libraries that you were using for your other stuff. But I hope you guys liked this. If it helped you and you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks.